Today I'm gonna to talk about the planning, shooting, and the editing of a commercial piece that I shot entirely by myself. So whether you're a small crew team or a solo operator, here's some of the guidelines that I use in terms of actually creating commercial content to increase your business and to actually make you more money in the long run. Now, while I say all of those things, I should probably show you the piece itself before I start breaking some of these steps down. So if you have a minute and 54 seconds, well, here's the actual commercial. Training is hard to understand if you've never had to push your body before. To some people, it doesn't make sense. The truth is, most conflict in sport and in life is entirely out of your control, and it's not by your design. Training puts you in the driver's seat. It can get in the extra rep, fight through another round of conditioning, and get used to the sore body and the aches and the pains that come from training, if it means that I'm better prepared for the fight that doesn't go according to plan. Training really isn't about getting it exactly right. It's about getting ready, and it's about staying ready for whatever comes next. All right, so this video is going to have four different parts, which is going to be your pre-production, your production, your post-production, and also your distribution, which is going to come in handy later on in this video. Now, planning your shoot is where you're going to make or you're going to break your edit, and you have to develop a concept, find the music track, and overall find the things that you're going to use to have a successful video shoot. Now, the overall concept that I went for for this video is I wanted to go with more a doc-style commercial setup. The reason why I wanted to do that is I'm trying to deviate away from those 30-second really quick cuts and flashy and punchy no pun intended, but I wanted to get away from a lot of the flair right out of the gate in my commercial and my filmmaking, and I wanted to get right into something a little bit more methodical and have more storytelling. Also to go along with the aspect of training for pretty much anything in athletics, it's slow and it's patient and there's a lot more thought than you would think about. And I've also been using Milanote to store all of my thoughts from my voiceover, the music I'm going to use, some of the inspiration, and even some of the shots that I want to get in my overall films. Now I do have the iPad app that I use quite a bit and I carry that with me on set to make sure that I have everything at my fingertips so I make sure I never actually miss a shot or miss the overall concept of what I'm trying to get after. Now we all like talking about gear and honestly this channel wouldn't be this channel if I didn't give you some sort of gear with some sort of context to it. And because I wanted to have a versatile kit, unsurprisingly, I'm using my Sony FX6. Not only is it gonna have all the exposure tools that I need, I can load my own LUTs in it, I have great audio options, and I have built-in NDs, I have everything that I need in order to get proper exposure and to get great audio at the same time. Now, the Sony FX6 is great for small teams and solo operators, however, the lens I'm using, it might not be. And that's gonna be the Miticon Zong Z T1.0 50 millimeter. Now, 50 millimeters is something that I grew up on and something that was my first prime lens and I actually started a lot of my filmmaking on a 50 millimeter lens. Not only are you gonna be able to get a versatile amount of shots from your wides, your mediums, and your tights, but this lens in particular has a certain character to it that really matched the overall concept that I wanted. This lens has imperfections. It does lean a little bit warmer and it doesn't necessarily have a sharp roll off, which is the reason why I chose this cinema glass in order to shoot this piece with. Now I am using my shoulder rig mount by Tilta, which is something that's a new addition into the kit, but it gives me more eye level shots and it also forces me into different angles that I didn't think of were if I was shooting handheld from the hip. Now it's a cool thing about this as well is that it does have a quick release plate at the bottom, which is also Manfrotto style, so I could use it to get locked off shots on my 502 tripod and it doesn't actually take a lot of time for me to do that. And if I wanna go into my old style of shooting, I can always just take it off the tripod and shoot from the hip in handheld. Now location scouting and lighting are gonna be in the same section because they both depend on each other. Now the location I picked had white walls and big windows that allowed for a lot of natural light. So I got really good exposure even though I wasn't using any lighting. 
Now, I only did use one light, and that was the Aperture 300D. And you might not believe this, but I actually didn't use a softbox on it at all. In fact, I actually used a technique called bouncing the light. Now, because I was in a very light, naturally lit space, I was able to bounce the light off of walls, mirrors, or even the ceiling in order to have it bounce back off and actually diffuse the light at the same time. Now, because I didn't use a softbox, my C-stand didn't have wheels, I didn't have a lot of time to pick up the stand and move it around my scene. So what I did was, as I bounced it off the ceiling of whatever scene I was in, and then honestly, all I do is reposition my framing and where I actually set up my shot to make sure that I'm hiding the light and you don't see all my secrets. Now, when I'm working as a solo operator, or I'm shooting by myself, I rely on my wides, mediums, and tights, which usually carries me most of the way through. You usually have your wides that are going to be big and it's going to help you establish a scene. So that way you can see exactly where all the action is going to be taking place. And it also helps bring more interest because you see such a wide shot, but when there's action happening somewhere in the middle, your eyes are naturally drawn to it. With your medium shots, I try to pay that off. So if I'm looking at a wide shot with a lot of motion happening somewhere in the frame and the rest of it is still, now when you cut to your medium, you actually give the viewer the payoff that they're looking for in terms of finding out what's actually happening in the scene. Now my tight shots hold a special place in my heart, but it's one of those things that I use to really make the viewer feel the action that are going on. So when you did see some close-up shots of the hands hitting the bag or things going on within the scene, I really wanted you to start to feel those emotions or really hear that sound design as things are going on. And on top of that, it does really cut well on top of your wides and your mediums in order to give you more depth into your scene. Now, triangle coverage is good and it's safe, but also it can be boring. If you're always just shooting your wide, mediums, and tights in a really methodical sense, what ends up happening is that you start to become a little bit predictable. Now, the way I try to set things up is I try to deviate a little bit from that wide, medium, and tight workflow where you could actually start to predict exactly what the next shot is going to look like. And in this piece, I actually use three different shots in order to break up the edit and make things feel a little bit more dynamic and a little bit less predictable. Now, the first shot I'm gonna talk about is going to be a silhouette shot. Now, most people want to have perfectly exposed subjects and perfectly exposed images. But with the dynamic range on the Sony FX6, I wanted to take advantage of that and expose my windows instead, which made my subject look a lot more like a character that hasn't been unlocked yet in Mortal Kombat. Now I still am going to be bouncing the light off of the ceiling to add more exposure to the far side of the body, but I really wanted to lean into the shadow and lean into the darkness of the shot to add more mystery and intrigue. And also in my inspiration, I found this in a lot of boxing movies where you had a backlit shot with the boxer shadow boxing in the middle, but I didn't have a big hard light source, so I just used the window instead. Now the second shot that I used in this piece is going to be the slow shutter effect. Now this is an effect that most people use in post, but I actually did this in camera instead. Now the Sony FX6 and a lot of cinema cameras use something called shutter angle. And you want to keep that to 180 degrees most of the time to have accurate motion blur. What you actually want to do is set your shutter angle to 360 degrees. Now at first it's going to be a little bit more overexposed, but you can also use the built-in NDs in your camera to compensate for that exposure so things don't look blown out. Now I picked this shot for two different reasons. One, it, it kind of looks cool and I've seen it in music videos before. And two, if you get punched in the face by a boxer, especially this one, that's exactly what your vision is going to look like. So what I wanted to do is emulate what it would feel like if the viewer was getting punched in the face by this person who's been hitting the bag this entire time. Now the last shot that I added into this piece was something that's a little bit counterintuitive to my shooting style. And honestly, that's just locked off tripod shots. Now with my usual style of shooting, I'm usually running around shooting on handheld and honestly just injuring my back half the time and in hopes to save my back and also just to mix up the types of shots from being too predictable was I added in some locked off tripod shots. Honestly, you don't really see them very often and it gives you an opportunity to help not only let your edit breathe, but also give some textures into your overall piece to help set the mood other than just getting a wide shot because that's honestly a little bit predictable as well. Now, on top of that, I just picked up the Manfrotto 502 and I've been using every excuse to actually use it. So getting these locked off shots to help break up the edit or let things breathe and set the tone actually came in handy in creating this overall piece. Now, in terms of the audio, I did use my Sennheiser MK416 to get some natural sound. And for voiceover, I did use my Zoom H6 to get some narration that's gonna be the foundation of my overall edit. Now, in terms of editing this piece, it's actually simple and straightforward and we're gonna get through it in a couple of different steps. Now, first thing you want to do is take your audio track and your voiceover, and that's going to go on the timeline first. You might want to actually cut up your voiceover by sentences so you can place them wherever you'd like instead of being predictable and letting it play all the way through. Now, I am shooting an S-Log3, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to color grade a bunch of the footage with a base grade using one of the LUTs in my pack. Most of the time on the FX6, I'm using my own LUTs to monitor my image, so I want things to look like how I saw them on the day as to when I'm doing my post-production, so I still have the same feel of what I was going for in terms of my overall image. Now, in terms of picking my selects, I use something called the pancake method, and you guys might be used to this in some other films that you've edited. 
where basically what you want to do is you want to take two timelines, a blank timeline and a timeline where all your clips are at, and you want to cut and drag and drop the different clips that you want that are going to be in your final film. That way you only pick the best of the best shots on the day and everything looks exactly the way you want them to because you're actually picking from the best scenes and the best shots that you have during your shoot. Now in terms of editing this piece once I have my selects and my audio, I actually went with the second half first. Generally speaking for me, I want to get the hard things out of the way. And typically I struggle with the faster paced parts of my audio. So I edited for that and then I worked my way backwards. This is where you're going to get a little bit fancy with the quick cuts, the sound design and zoom blurs and all the other stuff that you guys might see in high paced edits. And then at the beginning and the end, I'm gonna let things breathe a little bit and allow for a little bit more storytelling. Now, a cool part about getting a lot of the effects in camera means I don't have to do it in post-production. So something like the slow shutter effect was actually already there. I didn't have to do much to it. The silhouette shot was just color grading and the locked off tripod shots are, well, locked off tripod shots. So there's not much to do there. Now, one effect that I do use pretty commonly on YouTube and in a lot of my films is using the slow dolly zoom effect. The reason why I want to do that, especially if things are static and stationary, is I want to add a little bit more dynamicism. I still don't know if that's a word, but I want to add a little bit more dynamics into my shot. So if something's locked off and I feel like it's hanging off for too long, I don't necessarily want a still shot to be there and bore you. I'll add in a little bit of a digital zoom every now and again. And that's as easy as keyframing your clip from 100% to anywhere between 103 and 110%. And on DaVinci Resolve, you also have a graph editor as well, so it's incredibly easy for you just to drop it down and smooth it out so the transition isn't as harsh. Now, all of that's done, and just like a basic film bro, I added in my letterboxes, which is just a PNG file that I put on top of my footage so you feel like you watch an anamorphic film. You didn't. You didn't watch an anamorphic film. However, once I do that export, I'm not quite done yet. In fact, the captions in this video are actually made on CapCut. What I do is I actually export my video into CapCut and I use a text option to create auto captions. I pick the classic yellow Times New Roman font and honestly, that's all I had to do. So from beginning to end, from the planning, the shooting and the editing, it took about nine and a half to 10 hours total in terms of me creating this overall piece. And don't panic, it was spec work, which means I didn't get paid for it. However, we're going to talk about the distribution and this is overall how you're going to roll out this video in order to attract new clients and to get new business. And there's three different ways that I do this that we're going to talk about in the distribution phase. Now, first things first is going from a free to a fee and just going back to the place that you shot that work for and trying to see if you can get some paid work somewhere down the line or is there something that you guys can work out to do that again, but obviously have a little bit more budget. And all you have to do is just send a simple email thanking the person for letting you shoot at their location talking about how great the shoot actually went, and then showing them if they do want to work with you or if they do want to put some budget behind those films for their own business to help promote, you can always have that conversation and the door is always going to be open. Now for me personally, how that worked out is now I'm actually going to be involved in a docu-series for that gym, highlighting the different styles and the different fighters that are coming in, which is not only going to help my career, but it's also probably going to help my wallet a little bit. On top of that, now I have a relationship with the owner of that location. So now if I ever need a place I need to shoot at or if I have course content or I want to provide more value for you guys on YouTube, I can always come there and I can always count on that as a reliable location and a reliable place in order for me to make content either for myself, my clients, or the gym owner that I'm working with. Now what you could also do is reach out to companies in the same industry or companies adjacent to that industry and show them the look and the work that you put in and find out if there's a happy medium that you could actually have that style work with their brand and their company. I made up an email template that I sent to a couple of different brands whenever I have a spec piece that I'm proud of and I show it to them and just like the first option, I leave the door open in case they want to discuss doing work in the future. And the results of that are kind of the same and we'll talk about that in a couple of months because I can't say much now. but it's actually paid itself back pretty decently. And the third thing, and I'm actually really proud about this one is, well, showing you guys. Breaking down spec work or big client projects, especially when I have the ability to, has been not only a lot of fun for me on this YouTube channel, but it's also giving you guys a lot of value. In fact, it's giving you guys so much value that between January the 1st and March actually isn't even over yet, it's actually created 5,000 new subscribers, bringing me into that five digit 11,000 subscribers, which, I haven't really said with my face because I was sick for a couple of days, but uh, thank you guys for rocking with the content and, and really taking in some of the stuff that we've been talking about on this channel. Reach out to the company or the locations or the producer that helped you out. Reach out to other companies in the industry or even companies within the same industry. And also, if you have the capacity, if you have the opportunity, share it with the world. There are people that don't know the same things that you do and would give an arm and a leg just to get 1% better by learning from some of your own experiences. 
there's no need being afraid of the mean comment or anything like that. But if you do have the capacity, if you have any inclination to share some of your work and share some of your process with people on platforms just like YouTube, because you never know who's listening and you never really know what's going to happen next. And speaking of which, we'll probably talk about that in another video. That being said, hope you guys enjoyed the video or at the very least you learned something and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Thank you.